Security is one of the most important topics in Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, and it's obvious why. Your private key is the only thing that protects your money from being stolen by someone else. But keeping track of a private key and making sure it's secure is really hard for the average person. In response, hardware wallet security companies have formed to make private key management available to a wider audience. About a week ago, the largest company in the hardware wallet space, Ledger, announced a feature called Ledger Recover that made the whole crypto community question the security of their flagship products. So in this video, I'm going to be examining how safe Ledger devices are, what Ledger's role is in the hardware wallet market, and I'll be making recommendations about how you can protect your funds going forward. So go down below and smash the like button for crypto security and let's level up your brains. Before we get to Ledger and comparing it to all of the other crypto storage options out there, let's first talk about security technology in general. To understand security generally, we first need to understand trade-offs. So let's take a step back and look at the trade-offs of technologies that we use every day. Your smartphone is probably protected by a passcode, a biometric lock like a fingerprint or face data, or for some of you degenerates out there, maybe your phone is protected by nothing. Having no password is super convenient. You just get to tap your phone and it automatically works, but it's also not secure at all. Someone could just pick up your phone, open all your apps, send your money away, post flat earth content on your social media and install viruses on your phone. So again, very convenient, but not very secure. Next, we have a passcode, which I feel like pretty much everyone at this point has at least a passcode on their phones. Passcodes are more secure, but they're kind of a pain. Now you have to remember this passcode. Four digits isn't super secure. Six would be better, but six is kind of long. So some people just go with four. And then some of the Android people that are like, all right, six isn't even that secure. I want something more secure. They create that crazy path loop kind of drawing thing on the home screen. And so passwords generally definitely more secure, but also kind of annoying. And then finally, biometric data technologies like Face ID. Face ID is more secure than a password and a lot more convenient. You don't have to remember any random stuff, but there are potential privacy concerns, which makes some people uncomfortable. And if we're considering privacy and security to be kind of the same thing, then maybe biometric data is like less secure than a password, but also a little bit more convenient. The bottom line is that when you compare passwords to biometric authentication in this case, one of them isn't strictly better than the other. Instead, there are trade-offs and situations where different people might want to use one over the other. Some people are willing to trade the potential privacy impacts of Face ID for the convenience and extra security that is offered over a passcode. Other people are going to be like, I would rather just use a passcode. I don't want to use Face ID because I don't really trust Apple or Google with my personal biometric data. And both of those opinions are totally fine. Whenever we're analyzing security technology, it doesn't make sense to say that one thing is better than another thing, because in this case, the word better doesn't mean anything. Instead, we have to analyze the trade-offs and make a decision based on our personal security security preferences. So next, let's go ahead and analyze some of the trade-offs of different crypto storage options. All right, guys, so following that idea of trade-offs that we just talked about, I'm going to be charting a bunch of different crypto storage options here on this graph with the more secure options towards the right, the less secure options over towards the left, and then the more convenient options towards the top and the less convenient options towards the bottom. So let's go ahead and just get started here with Binance, an exchange that a lot of you are probably familiar with. It's the biggest exchange by volume in the world. And keeping your coins on Binance, just like keeping your coins on FTX is very, very convenient, but it is not very secure. Binance is an offshore, unregulated exchange. In my opinion, there are a bunch of sussy bacas. Well, don't lie to me, Walt, you sussy baka. And so I would not feel super great about keeping a bunch of money over on Binance, really not secure. But again, very, very convenient. You can trade in and out of your coins at any time. You just don't wanna be the person that isn't able to withdraw their coins from Binance at some point. I personally wouldn't keep any money on Binance that I wasn't like actively trading. And I advise most people to withdraw money that they don't wanna lose about once a week or as often as possible. Next, we've got Coinbase, also very, very convenient, a little bit more secure probably than Binance just because are a US publicly traded company and you can kind of, you know, put some amount of faith in like the US regulatory system and the transparency that they're providing you. But again, not super transparent. And I wouldn't keep tons of funds on Coinbase either the same way that I wouldn't keep tons of funds on Binance. Next, we're leveling up a little bit here to MetaMask. MetaMask is slightly less convenient than Coinbase and Binance, but it is much more secure. So it's probably about here. You do get to generate your own seed phrase, but you are probably most of the time generating a seed phrase 
plays on a computer that is connected to the internet and hopefully your computer just doesn't have any viruses so that you know someone with a keylogger or some other sort of virus that's installed in your computer doesn't see your 12 word seed phrase and then steal all your cryptocurrency. And then on top of that, MetaMask is usually used to interact with a bunch of DeFi protocols and there's a whole set of risks that comes with interacting with those protocols. It's sort of separate to what we're talking about here. Next, we've got Blue Wallet, which I think is just as convenient as MetaMask, but a little bit more secure just because it's Bitcoin only and they don't have to support all of these crazy tokens that MetaMask is supporting. And then similarly here with Trust Wallet, I think all these mobile wallets are probably just as secure and just as convenient as MetaMask. MetaMask is probably the most convenient just because everyone uses it and it can do a lot of things. So MetaMask is maybe up there, Trust Wallet's maybe like right here. But all of these are about as secure as each other. I think Blue Wallet's probably slightly more secure. All of them have great user experiences. And so they're all kind of clustered around here as pretty convenient, pretty secure. Next, you've got Brain Wallets. Brain Wallets are not very secure and they are not very convenient. So they would go like all the way down here in this corner. You really should not be storing Bitcoin on your brain unless you're trying to like flee some hostile regime or something. Overall, Brain Wallets, really good way to lose your cryptocurrency. Next, we have Electrum. It's a very popular Bitcoin desktop wallet. It's very fully functional. But as you can see from this picture, it is not very convenient. It kind of looks super old. It is pretty secure. I'd say when used correctly, it's a little bit more secure than Blue Wallet because you can link this to your full node and you can have the full functionality of everything that you would ever want to do with Bitcoin and the privacy that comes with sending all your transactions through your own node. But again, not very convenient, sort of a more advanced Bitcoin wallet that you could be using. And obviously it becomes much more secure if you pair it with any of the hardware wallets that we're going to be talking about next. So next we've got the Trezor. Trezors don't use secure elements. They can be secured a little bit better with passphrases, but I personally think that it's kind of sus that like if you don't use a passphrase, someone can just take your Trezor and because they're not using secure elements, they can just hack your device. So I'd say Trezor, like pretty convenient, pretty secure. It's probably about here. I think it's probably more secure than generating your own seed on Electrum and generating your own seed on Blue Wallet. But I think it's not as secure as some of the options that we're going to get to next. Next, we have Ledger. And I'm going to say that this version of Ledger is Ledger as we knew it a month ago. So this is Ledger with no Ledger Recover on the firmware. The code is not open source yet, but there is a secure element on board, which means that if someone gets your physical Ledger device, they're not going to be able to hack the private key out of the device. So let's say that this is a little bit more convenient and a little bit more secure than a Trezor. I personally think that Ledger Live is super easy to use and the whole onboarding experience of Ledger, I prefer to the onboarding experience of Trezor. Next, we have Ledger Recover, the service that started all of this chaos that we've been talking about. I think like we've been talking about, this service is very, very, very convenient, right? Instead of having to remember the words that come with all of these different self-managed wallets, you're now getting a service that's going to manage those words for you. So it is super convenient, but you're giving up some security because you're having to KYC yourself, opening up the device to like nation state attacks, I guess. I would put Ledger Recover as like about as convenient as leaving your coins on the exchange. And then it's hard to place where it would go in terms of security. I want to say somewhere around here. I think this is where you get into like very specific trade-offs. If you think about Ledger Recover versus something like a blue wallet, obviously something like a blue wallet, the keys are being generated on an iPhone that's been connected to the internet. If your iPhone or if your Android phone or wherever you're using blue wallet, if that device has a virus, you're opened up to issues from that perspective. But then with Ledger Recover, obviously the KYC information that you're providing to Ledger Recover is something you should be a little bit worried about from a privacy perspective, where something like Blue Wallet, you don't really have that issue. And then there are people that are worried now about like Ledger's firmware and like how safe is that? And so, you know, maybe Ledger starts to come over this way if you're talking about Ledger with the Ledger Recover firmware. And is it possible if there was an exploit in the firmware that someone could somehow extract your private keys from the secure element? I'll have links in the description down to videos from the CTO and the CEO of Ledger. They basically say that that can't happen, but then in more interviews that I'll have down in the description, people like Andreas Antonopoulos and Jamison Lopp, who are super respected in the security community, are saying that it is a possibility that, that could happen. I think that's like out of the scope of this video and too much for me to cover in, you know, 10 or 15 minutes here. So definitely check those videos out down in the description if you do have more questions about the very fine grained detail about how secure Ledger Recover is and how secure Ledger devices are in general 
after this update. As a recording of this video, the update has been postponed for a while, so we are going to be living in a world where we're using ledgers as they were from two weeks ago for, you know, quite a while here going forward. Ledger Recover is not coming out anytime soon, but I think that this is about where I would place it on this convenience versus security graph for now. And then finally, we have the cold card, which I think is the most secure way that you could be generating your seed phrase at this point, and it's probably about there in terms of convenience. And so at this point, I think this chart is kind of interesting to look at. Each of these devices is in a totally different area on the chart, and you're going to have different people that would want to use different ones of these devices or storage options, I guess, in different scenarios. So I think for like the exchanges, not very secure, but very convenient. Those people are like your grandpa, he's got $25 of crypto on an exchange, and he's hoping that it turns into $100 five years from now so that he can go buy himself a nice steak dinner or something like that. If he loses his $25 of crypto, it's not the end of the world. If you're more serious into crypto and you have a bunch of money on exchanges, I would say definitely start to look at some of these other options and only keep like small trading amounts on exchanges at any given time. Next, Brain Wallet, not very secure and not very convenient. You would really only want this if you were like fleeing the country or something like that. Hopefully none of you are in that situation. Uh, it definitely is a use case, but again, not very secure, not very convenient, super easy way to lose your funds and relatively technical as well. Next, we've got these kind of interesting options in the middle. I think that this is probably like the like 100 to potentially like $5,000 range. I know in Ledger Recover, they're saying that it's insured for up to $50,000, but I personally wouldn't want to put $50,000 on Ledger Recover. I would maybe be comfortable putting some amount like this, maybe $100 to $5,000 in one of these services. But again, that's just me and someone that really wants the convenience of Ledger Recover might put more money in there than I would be willing to put in there. And I think it is going to be a really easy move from exchanges if you're, you know, an older, less technical person or just generally a less technical person. It's going to be a much easier move for you to go from something like Coinbase to Ledger Recover than going from Coinbase to something like, you know, Electrum or Cold Card, right? We would maybe want you in the security community to move down to some of these options down here. But again, you know, they're much less convenient and it's going to be harder to get someone that's all the way up here to move all the way down there. So next we've got like the three big hardware wallet manufacturers here. There are other hardware wallets you could use and I think they would all live within this circle basically. I think Ledger, Trezor, and Cold Card are a good representative sample of the hardware wallets that are out there. Cold Card being the most secure and probably the hardest to get set up with using. And then Ledger and Trezor being kind of similar. There's trade-offs there with security. It almost depends what your philosophy and your sort of like outlook on the world is. I personally find Ledger's easier to use, but really if you're using either one and you're kind of migrating from this $1,000 to $5,000 range, you know, you can't go wrong with a Ledger, you can't go wrong with the Trezor in my opinion. But then ultimately what you would want is like a cold card or like an Electrum wallet backed up by a cold card hooked up to your node. And if you had all that going for you, you'd be down here at very, very secure, but again, not very convenient. These are relatively technical. This UI is not very nice to look at. Maybe in the future, it will be nicer to look at and all of us will be, you know, happy days. Like we have a super secure solution in the cold card and we have a super nice UI to look at in Electrum, but we're just not there yet. So hopefully you found this helpful and hopefully you can see how Ledger Recover and Ledger and Trezor sort of sit in this market where they're a bridge from the exchanges into this sort of $100 to $5,000 range. And then it's a pretty easy transition to get from one of these wallets in the middle over to a Ledger or a Trezor. And maybe you're going to Ledger or Trezor at between like a thousand and like 50,000 or something like that. Maybe you start to think about a cold card and you're comfortable with the idea of seed phrases and this is no longer daunting to you. And now you're where everyone wants you to be. You're very, very secure and you're ready to start setting up multi-sigs and other things like that using Electrum and the other open source software tools that are sort of available and out there in the Bitcoin community. So now that we've made this super crazy chart, let's go ahead and talk about Ledger's role in the market and why I personally don't think they're going away. Ledger is the largest Bitcoin and crypto hardware wallet provider in the world. And despite the success of the company, more than 95% of crypto users don't use hardware wallets, which means that most of them are probably just leaving their coins on the exchange and are susceptible to another FTX style situation. Hi, my name is Sam and this is my story. The number one way that hardware wallet users lose their funds is by losing their seed phrase. And the biggest reason that people are not comfortable using hardware wallets is that they don't want the responsibility of having to keep track of their own seed phrases. And a lot of us in the Bitcoin and like self-sovereignty whatever community can be like, oh, that's dumb. You should just want the personal responsibility and you should learn and you should do these things. But that's just not how the world works. A lot of regular people are going to 
you'll want a recovery service like Ledger Recover. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter what you or I or any of these other random cypherpunks on Twitter think about the situation. Even if Ledger isn't the most secure device of all time, and even if you personally would be uncomfortable putting your entire life savings onto a single Ledger, it doesn't mean that Ledgers are useless. If the goal is to have the entire world on cold card three of five multi-sigs, I think it's okay for Ledger to be out there for people to get comfortable with the technology and to understand what self-custody is and how it works. And if you don't think so, that's totally fine. That's your opinion. But I, the CEO of CoinKite, and all of the other reasonable people in the world disagree with you. Companies will create services in response to problems that their customers are facing. If no one ever uses the service, then Ledger will shut it down. And if lots of people use the service, then Ledger will continue to operate it. You don't have to use the service. And just because the service is not helpful to you, it doesn't mean that it's not helpful to someone else, which is basically the entire point of markets. If you guys want to learn more about this entire situation and why people were upset about it, I'll have links to all the videos that I watched to get ready for this video down in the description. There's a lot of really great interviews, especially the one Peter McCormick did on what Bitcoin did that includes the CEOs of both Cold Card and Ledger on the same panel. It's a really good discussion and it's really cool that he was able to get this together so quickly after this whole situation unfolded. As for what's going to happen next with Ledger, I think that there are a handful of ways forward. I think that the public backlash has been good because it forces companies like Ledger in this situation to take stock of like what is the mission of their company and what are their customers saying. And so now in response to the backlash, Ledger has released a timeline for when they're going to start open sourcing different elements of their software and then also putting out a white paper for the Ledger Recover protocol. Ledger will continue to thrive in the industry because of how easy their product is to use, the work that they continue to do to make their products better and to meet the needs of these different market segments. And they're definitely not going away because they're not just a product company. They also offer services to other companies in the space like penetration testing, which is hugely valuable for a lot of these other hardware wallet manufacturers. And again, for everyone that's mad at me for making this video, you don't have to use a ledger. Lots of people will because it's the easiest way to get started using a hardware wallet, and that's totally fine. If you're securing life-changing amounts of Bitcoin, I personally think that using a single ledger is not a good idea. And if you are at that point where you're ready to take your security to the next level, go ahead and check out this video over here to learn more about cold card and check out these videos over here to learn more about multi-sig. I love you all. See you next week.